Pay close attention. The news you are about to see is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you news as it relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Israel Hawkins. Well, uh, you know, we're seeing currently, you know, some police officers who are actually leaving the force um, due to the fact that they said that they just don't have the support that they uh, used to have uh, some years ago. Uh, we're going to look at the Mideast crisis where apparently they're imposing a ceasefire between the Israelis and the Palestinians. There's been a lot of bombing campaigns going on with that. And also China's involvement with Russia. And we're going to talk a little bit about some riots that have been taking place in New York and California. But first, regarding the police officers who are leaving the force at an alarming rate in Seattle, Washington. One officer, Clayton Powell, who served 27 years on Seattle's police department, is retiring three years short of his 30-year goal, citing that the support and leadership for officers is no longer there. Well, last year's riots in Seattle over the death of uh, George Floyd were compounded by Seattle's decision to abandon one of their precinct's departments, allowing demonstrators, some armed, occupy an entire neighborhood for a full month. Wow. Well, Powell said having rocks, bottles, and cinder blocks thrown at you in addition to seeing local businesses get destroyed is devastating. You watch and see families lose their livelihood due to that destruction, mm. and we can't do anything about it while not being allowed to intervene, he said. Now, city leaders allowed a police-free zone after protesters were repeatedly hit by tear gas but closed it down after weeks of violence. Now, the money that council cut from police will be reallocated through a still undefined process involving community leaders. Hmm. Well, after the council cut the police budget, the department's chief announced her early retirement out of protest. Uh, Powell said there needs to be an investigation as to how things got the way they did, but he said defunding the police is not the answer. Well, currently there are five million dollars still slated to be cut from Seattle's uh, police department budget in the coming year. And that's just one, but uh, as we've mentioned before, quite a few uh, police departments like that having that same problem with funding getting cut and then also officers leaving. That's right. Well, interest in spirituality has been increasing in recent years while people's interest in religion has been on the steady decline, especially among millennials. Now, Arizona Christian University's Culture Research Center revealed that 43% of millennials either don't believe in God, don't care, or don't know if they do. Now, the study looked at four generations, millennials uh, born from 1984 to 2002, Generation X born from 1965 to 1983, baby boomers born from 1946 to 1964, and the builders born from 1927 to 1945. So four different uh, classifications or age groups, if you would, right. in their survey. Hmm. Interesting. They went back four generations. They found that 90% of the builders uh, from the builders generation uh, believe that you should treat others the way you want to be treated, while less than half of millennials agree with that sentiment. 66% uh, of millennials are willing to try anything at least once compared to only 28% of builders, a little more cautious there. 28% right. uh, of boomers believe in God and nearly half of all boomers believe they will go to heaven when they die only because they confessed their sins and accepted Jesus as their Savior. That compared to only 20% of Gen Xers and 16% of millennials who believe in going to heaven as well. So as the generations went on, 
the belief system declined. started to decrease. That's right. Well, regardless of the generation's differences, the majority of Americans call themselves Christians, ranging from 58% of millennials to 83% of builders. Now, researchers say that the beliefs and behaviors of younger people, especially millennials, threaten to reshape the nation's religious parameters beyond recognition. And it seems like uh, what a lot of people's belief system in regards to you know what they call Christianity or a lot you know identifying themselves as being Christians is for the most part as it seems like with a lot of religions kind of that only in name only as none of them really uh, they've even said that you know I don't really practice it I just kind of that's what I grew up around in my environment. Right, but the builders, um, their, their principle that they lived by, treat others the way you want to be mm -hmm. treated, you know, that if everybody followed just that one rule, uh, it would, morality would, you know, take off quite a bit just by doing that one thing. Yeah, so apparently morals were taught four generations ago a lot more so in the home and in society than, than they are right now. Right. Yeah, so a great decline there. Well, families are wondering where they're going to lay their heads to sleep as evictions start up again as states challenge the moratoriums imposed by the pandemic. Well, it might start small, but is expected to grow very quickly as millions of Americans owe over $53 billion to landlords. Well, one man and his 17-year-old son in Dallas, Texas, Anthony Upshaw, was evicted from his home recently as his son was upstairs studying uh, homeschooling or homework, excuse me. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court lifted the moratorium on evictions March 31st of this year, and the Dallas-Fort Worth area has the third largest eviction filings in the country. Well, Upshaw lost his job early in the pandemic and has been struggling ever since. Now, not knowing where to go as he watched his furniture be placed on the front lawn by constables, you can see the frustration in his face. Now, he wasn't the only one in that neighborhood to be evicted. His neighbor, Linda Bowie, also being evicted and has 24 hours to vacate the property. Now, she told CBS News that she's planning to just sleep in her son's car in the meantime because she has nowhere else to go. Yeah, and that's one of the things that's not really talked about very much is how the ep economic impact uh, has affected so many people, you know, where they did lose their jobs and, you know, they weren't really able to pay their bills and they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Right. Well, Peter Sy, the landlord, said that the mortgage is still due even though the rent is not being paid. He said that he's owed about $25,000 to $28,000 in back rent and that he's been losing money for about seven to eight months. Mr. Upshaw said, quote, it's like America is going backwards, end quote. Well, uh, this as both he and Mrs. Bowie and, of course, many other Americans survive to um, struggle to survive in this new COVID economy. Right. Well, the coronavirus, uh, as we've talked about so many times here in the different changes as it continues to uh, mutate and continue to change, now we're finding out research that coronavirus doesn't just hijack our cells, it can actually alternate our DNA according to a new study. So that takes it up to a whole new level there when you can start alternating somebody's DNA. Yeah, because your DNA controls so many different factors uh, in your body as far as, you know, what you're going to become and even helps to influence certain choices that a person might make. And we noticed that a lot of these things that we talked about in previous broadcasts with coronavirus, it leaves people with mental confusion. You right. know, it affects the mind. And of course, you need your mind for decision making process. Right, it's just another piece of the puzzle that when you put it all together, it does make a lot of sense, you know, especially when you mention the confusion there yeah. in the mind, dementia as we talked about, and choices that are being made by people who have that. That's right. Well, nearly 40% of all Americans are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, but a booster shot could be necessary and, of course, in the works, according to medical professionals, uh, by, well, this fall. Now, that is even if you are already fully vaccinated. Dr. Anthony Fauci said that vaccines are effective for at least six months and likely more, but booster shots will likely be needed and will depend on following the durability of immunity um, and is essentially 
recommending, uh, he said, a booster shot at an appropriate time. So they've got to kind of look at the immune system and how effective that booster shot still, uh, or how effective the vaccine still is in regards to the person's immune system to determine when and if they'll need a booster shot. Well, the first dose of Pfizer's vaccine, if you remember, in the United States was administered five months ago to a critical care nurse. Well, as we've talked about also, Katan, with the coronavirus now, um, the, there's continuing to be a push to vaccinate every uh, yes. single person. Mm -hmm. But as we've seen, the numbers have started to decline. Yeah. So now we see states that are offering incentives mm -hmm. to be vaccinated. Now, one, Maryland, they're actually doing a 40-day straight uh, lottery where oh, they're yeah. giving away mm -hmm. $40,000 for anyone who, um, you know, get your name thrown in there if you uh, become vaccinated. vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And I know um, also in uh, Rhode Island, there was one nurse who was actually going door to door to uh, administer vaccines to people who are homebound. And also in Philadelphia, one um, nonprofit group was actually offering free meals to people who also got a shot. So they're really trying to, they're seeing the numbers decline. They know that they don't have as many vaccinated as they would like to see. So they're trying to offer people incentives to get them in the door so they can get that jab. And I imagine uh, that they, that as this goes on, their incentives, they're probably going to keep trying to up it there mm -hmm. and get people vaccinated. That's right. Well, as we turn it over to our field correspondent, Larry McGee, he has some more information for us regarding the conflict that has been ongoing in the Middle East for many, many years now. And the question on a lot of people's minds is who's funding Hamas? Larry, what do you have for us? There were celebrations and dancing in the streets following a tenuous ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. The agreement is said to have been brokered by Egypt, temporarily at least stemming the violence, which is being called the worst bout of aggression between the two since 2015. As the dust begins to clear now, Palestinians are communicating horrifying experiences of their homes exploding and shattering under the surprise and sudden impact of Israeli bombs as their children ran and hid and screamed in fright. The U.N. Secretary General Anthony Gutierrez says that the goal now must be to develop a more durable peace, achieved in large part by the revitalization of the peace process and negotiations for the two-state solution. Though precariously, the truce between Israel and Hamas has held up until now, despite very high tensions, the fighting between the two left over 200 Palestinians and 12 Israelis dead. Considering the large number of missiles and rockets which Hamas seemingly has at its disposal, despite having sprung from and being stationed in an area which is known internationally for its poverty, many people are starting to become curious as to where they are acquiring the resources to make such extensive weapons purchases. The answer coming from some investigators is Iran, Turkey and Qatar, the latter of which has a reputation among Eastern nations for sponsoring terrorism. Reports are that they have transferred as much as $1.8 billion to the group so far, bolstering up the organization to the tune of about $20 million per month. And there are serious questions as to whether or not the money is being given and employed for the stated purpose of sustaining the Palestinian people, since over 50% of the residents in Gaza are said to be living in poverty, even despite such a large money bag. As for Hamas, the self-proclaimed militant group is said to rake in and binge on $700 million dollars per year. YPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Katan, Jeff, back to you. Katan, pretty interesting report there that Larry had for us um, with Hamas, you know, labeled as a terrorist organization, the third highest mm. paid or highest funded right. terrorist organization, $20 million a month, you know, wow. and of course, uh, that going into not helping their people out as many of the Palestinians are suffering, mm -hmm. but being put into the military spending. Yeah, and when you take a look at how many thousands of rockets or hundreds of rockets mm -hmm. that they do fire into Israel, irregardless if it was Israel or another country, you know, there's a lot of money being spent on, well, not finding peace with their neighbor, but actually doing harm towards their neighbor. Right, but that makes sense, though, now if you see that funding, because, you know, the Palestinians as a whole, they're not a very, uh, you know, they're pretty poor, um, uh, people there mm -hmm. but now you see where they're getting all the money there with Hamas and like you said all those rockets aren't cheap right right 
Well, attacks of a different kind are on the rise in cities across the United States. There are investigations taking place in New York and Los Angeles right now concerning some anti-Semitic violence, which seems to be directly related to the fighting between Israelis and the Palestinians. Now, one incident uh, took place in Times Square. A caravan of pro-Palestinians threw fireworks into a crowd of Jewish pro-Israel demonstrators. And in another incident in New York, a 29-year-old Jewish man was attacked by a mob of men. One of the men involved used a crutch as a weapon and has been charged with a hate crime. Just a week before the fighting in Israel started, there were 131 anti-Semitic incidents reported. But that number jumped to 193 the week after the bombing campaign began in Gaza. Well, there has also been an increase in anti-Semitic posts on social media like Twitter, where people are saying things like, quote, I think Hitler was right when it comes to the Holocaust. Some people just don't deserve to live, and the Israelis are at the top of the list, unquote. Well, another one said, Jews have a long history of murder, and my heart hurts for our Palestinian brothers and sisters. These Zionists are a bunch of animals, tweeted another. Well, you can see the hatred coming from both sides of the fence in regards to this conflict. Well, it's pretty clear the increase is directly linked to the violence in Gaza and Israel, but it's almost immeasurable how many incidents are now occurring because of it in America. Well, in L.A., several Jewish restaurants were attacked and synagogues um, are also under fire. The LAPD continues to be called to investigate more and more possible hate crimes. In Arizona, a rock was thrown through a window, and in Utah, a swastika was etched into glass. New York City's mayor's, Mayor Bill de Blasio has told his community that police are on high alert to make synagogues and other Jewish sites throughout the city safe and secure. Well, ironically, while the anger rages on in America, there is a glimmer of hope that a ceasefire will hold between Israel and Hamas. Now, there has been an offer, there has been no offer, uh, no offer, rather, of a peaceful solution to end the fighting as yet. So right now, it's a waiting game. Now, in Jerusalem, there were also some new fighting between Palestinian protesters and Israeli police outside the Alaska Mosque, but it did not turn into anything too serious. Little skirmishes, if you would, mm -hmm. not the uh, serious, you know, back and forth rocket fire that had been taking place. That's right. Well, the night skies are just black now, rather than lit up with the red and orange streaks from Hamas rockets and Iron Dome missiles seeking them out. In just 11 days of violence, over 200 Palestinians lost their lives in Gaza, 60 of whom were children. On the Israeli side, 12 people were killed, including two children. children. Uh, Israel had only agreed to stop the fighting since it had reached its military goals in Gaza, uh, which included killing top Hamas and Palestinian commanders and continuing to destroy large parts of the underground tunnel system Hamas uses. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu bragged about Israel's success, saying, quote, At this stage, I can say that we did daring, innovative things, and this without being dragged into unnecessary adventures. If there had been a need to send a ground force into Gaza, we would have done so. But I thought that this time, in light of the goals that we have set, we could achieve better results in other ways, safer ways, he said, unquote. Well, United States President Joe Biden, uh, however, says he's determined to find a solution to bring peace to the region for both sides. In a statement, the president said, quote, I believe the Palestinians and the Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely and to enjoy equal measures of freedom, prosperity and democracy. My administration will continue our quiet, relentless diplomacy toward the end, that end. I believe we have a genuine opportunity to make progress and I'm committed to working for it, end quote. Well, West Asia, also known as part of the Middle East, has many difficult issues facing it, which can be a challenge for any world power to try to intercede and offer solutions. Uh, most often we hear of the American government holding talks to or making plans to assist these countries. But now China 
You heard right, China has decided to make its move and see if they can persuade countries in West Asia to see things their way. Now, the hope is that China will show off its ability to be a world power equal to or greater than that of the U.S. When the last war in Gaza took place back in 2014, uh, Xi Jinping uh, had only been in office less than a year and, it was, and was in no way ready to take on trying to find peace in the Middle East. But now it's 2021 and Xi is a seasoned leader of his party, the People's Republic and his country, and he's looking to assert himself and China among the world's powers so he's starting with the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. Well, so far, China has offered to be a mediator for the two sides. Beijing has invited negotiators from Israel and Palestine to fly to China for talks. Now, why would the largest Asian nation do this, given they do not have any real stake in this issue? Well, some are shaking their heads in wonderment at how they could have any leverage to help the two sides. Well, there is a bit of concern as well that using subtle diplomacy, which is always needed when it comes to these two groups of people, is not China's strong point. Hmm. But this isn't the only move China has made. It's also offering a four-point solution pushed by UN Security Council member, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Now, the proposal calls for, one, an immediate ceasefire, two, the lifting of uh, lifting the blockade on Gaza and offering humanitarian assistance. Three, the UN Security Council to be very closely involved. And four, pushing the two-state solution forward. And interesting that China, as we mentioned there, doesn't really have any real stake there, but yet they want to get involved in all, you know, out of all the different conflicts, they pick that one there between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And, you know, lo and behold, they want to push the two-state solution, which right. we know has been talked about quite a bit. A lot of leaders are saying it's the only way it's ever going to work. Right. And you kind of wonder what China's end goal is, you know, because uh, in today's society, not many countries get involved in another country's affairs unless they have something to gain for it. But like you said, it's interesting that they are harping on that two-state solution to see that move forward between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Right. Well, in other Asian news, Russia has now decided it will no longer uphold the Open Skies Treaty. Not even a year has passed since President Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the treaty, saying that Russia had not followed the pact, and until they did, the U.S. would no longer take part. But the Russian parliament's lower house, called the State Duma, has now taken a vote to remove itself and blames the U.S. for its move to break down global security. Now, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rabkov uh, explained the vote, uh, quote, depriving Russian aircraft of the open sky in the access of its airspace. United States kept the possibility to get documents on observation flights over the territory of Russia from its allies from NATO. We should note the treaty limits such a possibility, end quote. Well, the goal of the Open Skies Treaty was to build trust between Russia and the West by allowing the signatories of the agreement to operate reconnaissance flights over each other's territories. Now, there are over three dozen countries who joined the treaty, which was signed in 1992, but didn't take effect until 2002. The treaty allowed members to collect information about each other's military forces and activities. Now, the purpose is to help monitor everyone's compliance when it comes to various international arms control and other agreements. Now, to date, over 1,500 flights have been conducted under that treaty. But last year, uh, President Trump insisted Russia was not following the terms of the agreement and pulled out. Moscow denied the accusations and continued to stay with the pact. Russia had uh, one condition in order to stay in it, however, and that was that all NATO allies had to agree they would not share information with the United States government, which uh, they gathered on their surveillance flights over Russia. But 
NATO allies never did uphold Russia's stipulation. Even though Russia is pulling out of the pact, they would return under one important condition. As the Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova stated, we are ready to deal with all mutual concerns as a whole, but such a discussion will only become possible after the United States would have made an unequivocal statement about the, de the, the decision to return to the treaty. Well, Russia's lower house conducted their vote just hours prior to Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's first in-person meeting. Uh, the meeting between the two counterparts was held in uh, Rakovic, Iceland, and did not seem to be disrupted in any way by Russia's decision to leave the Open Skies Treaty. Well, finally, we have all heard about a war of words and how world leaders use them to impress their allies and warn their foes. In a recent statement, Russian President Vladimir Putin expressed his contempt for those who are coming against the Russian nation and what they will face. He said, quote, everyone is trying to bite us or bite something off of us, but they should know that we will knock out everyone's teeth so that they can't bite. And the key, is, the key to this is the development of an armed forces. But I want to stress once again that we are not following the path of militar, militarizing our economy, end mm -hmm. quote. Interesting. And, and that considering the fact that, that the United States has, uh, you know, their military budget dwarfs that of both the next two largest bu largest budgets, which are uh, Russia and China, by several billions of dollars. Right, and you know the we've talked about how Russia has made quite a bit bit of their advancements, recent mm -hmm. advancements mm -hmm. in their military, and you know Russian President Vladimir Putin making some pretty harsh statements there. I mean, it's certainly not a friendly message saying, hey, look, I'd rather have peace, right. you know, but as we mentioned, it's a warning to other countries that, look, if you mess with us, this is what's coming. And, you know, we see that a lot going back and forth now with the world leaders. Um, things are breaking down. Mm -hmm. The Open Skies Treaty, mm -hmm. no longer there. Um, there have been other treaties. They've since been dissolved. So it seems like all the steps that had been put in place to try to hold the nations back mm -hmm. have now been removed and at some point we know if there's going to be a breaking point. That's right. It's kind of like what we talked about earlier in the broadcast. As you see the generations move forward, they're less likely to have some type of belief in some type of uh, you know, God or religion. Well, it's, it seems like it's the same way with the nations where you know, 50, 60 years ago, you know, they were making moves to try to uh, bring about some type of peace or stability because they saw what was on the horizon in regards to nuclear war and the weapons and what they will cause. Now we're kind of getting slowly away from that and as was mentioned, war, war of words will eventually lead to a war of bombs which will eventually bring about the darkening of the sun with nuclear weaponry. Right, the fear of using nuclear weapons seems to be being pushed aside mm -hmm. and these leaders are now starting to throw it around in their words their discussion instead of like you said being something that you know nobody wanted to touch that now it seems like it's very much a reality that's right well there is uh, more information that you can find out regarding the current times that we are in and what is shown through prophecy to come about as the result of the nation's in their war of words and the actions that are to follow. Well, when you, if you want more information, of course you can contact the House of Yahweh. And when you do, don't forget to request your free copy of the Prophetic Word magazine and the monthly newsletter. Uh, here's how you contact the House of Yahweh by writing them at the House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas 79604. You can call them at 1-800- 613-9494. You can visit them on any of their websites by going to Yahweh.com, YisraelHawkins.com, or Yahweh'sBranch.com. You can visit our website by going to YPNNews.com. For email, you can email the House of Yahweh at info 
at Yahweh.com. And for all calls outside the United States, please dial the number on your screen. And of course, don't forget the uh, best tools to aid you in the study of and understanding of the scriptures and prophecies. You can go to the Yisrael Says and Ask Yisrael program online anytime by typing in YisraelSays.com or AskYisrael.com. Well, as the nation's leaders are throwing back and forth these words of war, mm -hmm. there is someone that's bringing you words of peace. Don't go anywhere. Up next is Yisrael Hawkins. For all of us here at YPN News, I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. And I'm Katan Alexander. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.